Are you the type of artist who has explored different mediums? Well, our guest, Darren Yeo, tried out clay, had an exhibit, and was recognized as a sculptor before diving into watercolor. Fast forward to 2020, during lockdown, he created a community of 100,000 hobbyists and watercolor enthusiasts. That is a lot of people. So tune in to learn more about watercolor as an unforgiven medium and how it is also a life lesson. Key tips to get started in watercolor and how not to give up. How to learn and unlearn techniques to achieve the style you want. Why you don't have to wait for inspiration to get started with art. How everything in life can be tied up with art and how to have a growth mindset and creativity. If you want to be part of the conversation, then send in your questions and topics you want us to cover to hello at etcherlab.com. Hey, this is Jesse from Etcher. We believe in your power to create, so we invited artists from all around the globe to inspire you to keep on creating. Join us in this journey and let's celebrate creativity. This is Make More Art, the podcast. I think art for me, is, uh, it's always been something that I've been interested in since I was a kid. And um, probably that one of the first things that I, that I picked up was probably just sketching with pen, with oh. pencil. I remember having coloring in books when I was a little boy at my grandma's house. Uh, you, you know, it's the part of that creative process, I think, started from a, from a very young age. And, you know, I, I think it was more like when I got into, you know, primary school and stuff like that, I, I you know, it was more of a, a hobby thing for me. I really enjoyed it. And um, it was, I think, something that my, you know, my mom picked up on. And um, I put in a lot of time. Uh, I don't know. It was just, it was just something that was, that was natural for me. It was just um, fun. And, you know, you got all these other subjects that kids, you know, kids get kind of pressured into doing in school, things like maths and science and things that they, you know, but some, you know, obviously a lot of kids like those type of things, but art for me was something that was easy and it could pass the, I remember just being able to do it and not worry about the time. And I started getting into, uh, yeah, like a, a bit of like sculpting and I, I've used mainly like clays and um, did a whole bunch of these sculpture works. I had a f- things exhibited in, um, in Perth as in the uh, city of Melville. And I got a, I got a, uh, an award for that um, by the, by the council and I shook, um, met the mayor, as well at the time that was a really big deal for me i mean i was only 15 or 16 and that was uh you you know for me it was a huge thing um i think the you know in my in my family see my dad um he used to work as a graphic designer when he was younger um but it wasn't something that he'd encourage me to go into Mm -hmm. he would say it's kind of like a bit of a it, it's it's tough you got to like freelance um a lot of it just has to you know it's not stable work this and that and um you know i think my parents were a bit worried about me when i said i wanted to do art for a job um and you know, i think coming from like an asian kind of family asian background as well like my uh, my mom and dad are from singapore and and over there it's uh, I, I think it's it's pretty um you know education is a, is a really big thing and they wanted me to study something you know like the, the usual stuff like engineering um but yeah that those things just didn't really those things just didn't really uh, kind of interest interest me but um yeah i guess going back to that first point where you know i was doing um sculpture works and stuff um and i, and I won a bunch of awards that was a, a real big deal for me but i i think um around that time because i i felt like maybe it was too too much of a, a shot i felt like maybe i wasn't good enough maybe i wouldn't be able to make it um like i just didn't have the confidence and so i, I left art behind but um, i ended up studying psychology uh, mm. at, at uni i did like an honors honors degree in psychology and i graduated from that but you know during uni and stuff i did bits of art he- here and there um and then later on after i'd finished started working i did a few like commission pieces um in in watercolors um and just some drawings and things like that but it was something that was left in in the wayside but it was always something that i wanted to continue on Mm -hmm. um and it was something i I don't want to kind of look back and think uh, you know i didn't do it because i was afraid to do it like i was just people just said that i can't make it or, or something like that or um as an artist or because at the end of the day even if it um you know i think art should be something 
that should be done for its own sake pr primarily. Mm -hmm. And even if it doesn't, um, you know, it, it lead to a traditional sort of career path where you, you know, you're getting a salary or something like that, I think it's still enjoyable for its own sake and it's still very precious. Um, and, and this has just been nagging at me for so long. And so last year during lockdown, and before that I was, I was getting into watercolours quite a bit last year during lockdown, I just decided I'm going to go 100% with it and just put in another like six seven hours a day just working on my art and trying to get it out on social media learning everything okay. how to do it um and uh yeah i kind of got back kind of got back into it i left it behind as a kid and um but now i've come back come back to it thank you for, for taking us through it's interesting because art has always been a part of you ever since and you mentioned that your your dad so is also a designer. Interestingly, you said you came from Singapore. I was based in Singapore for a while. I love Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> you did mention that you started with sculptures. You were a sculptress and you did receive an award for it. Mm. Are you still pursuing it? Or you totally left it behind? Um, it's, it's something I, I really want to get back into. I think mm -hmm. as I've for some reason now, um, when I was younger, I didn't care about the mess of all the clay. I mean, I'd have a table and just mess all over the place. But these days, I'm, I'm, I, I've seemed to become much more of a, an organized and neat person. And <laughs> <laughs> like, like the thought of all, like cleaning up after all of the clay and using all the water and stuff, I just don't know how I deal with that. Um, but I do have a separate table. So I, I think I'm, you know, I might get back yeah. into that because yeah. it was something yeah. that, um, I, I felt it's it, it, with clay, you're kind of refining something and it's very, very forgiving. Unlike watercolors um, and other mediums, you, you can sort of work on something, just kind of spray it down and then cover it with some glad wrap and then keep working on it until it starts looking like whatever you want it to. Yeah. So it's, yeah, definitely. I, I do want to get back into it at some stage. And um I think it was something that really stuck with me when I was young. It's interesting as well when you mentioned it. I was looking at your bio and you said that you, you were a sculptress before. I did play around with clay, well, air dry clay. So it's more like decorative, not functional pieces. Of course, you cannot eat on anything, <laughs> air, right? Clay. Mm. But I feel your pain about, you know, the clutter and <laughs> the mess. But I do love the, the feel of the clay and its ability to transform based on how much pressure you put into it. Like what you said, it's very forgiving. You don't like it, you just drunk and then do it again. Um, what made you decide to try out watercolor? Mm. Take me through that decision process of wanting to pursue it. Make More Art the Podcast is made possible by listeners like you. So we would like to give a shout out to Anastasia Vishnevsky from YouTube on a recent episode with Clarice Gomez. She said, Thanks for sharing this. I'd carve out some creative time but was feeling completely unmotivated. Went for a walk and listened to this podcast and now I'm eager to jump in and set thoughts of perfectionism aside. I appreciate the creative push and encouragement in these difficult times. Make sure to never miss an episode by clicking the subscribe button now. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. Um... I think initially why I got into to watercolors was that it just seemed like something very easy to get into. Like mm. you, you only need a few materials. Um, I played around with oils and acrylics and you need, uh, you, you know, you got to deal with some chemicals, especially with oils, terps and things like that. And like watercolors just to me seemed like, you know, I know I wanted to get back into art and, you know, sculpting just felt like it was so long ago, you know, ago and, and I saw some nice watercolor art online and I thought, well, um, you know, there was a few artists that I, I really admired um, at the time. There was a guy, uh, Joseph Zabukovic, mm -hmm. and um, he, he's a one, he's like a really, um, you know, I really, really respect him. He's a watercolorist from Australia, um, master watercolorist. And I actually met him because I went to a, an, an event like a, in 2014, 2015 called the, it was like a big paint out in WA, okay. Western Australia. And um, he, I, I remember that point because I was just starting to learn back then and I was right, quite frustrated at my progress um, because I thought it would be so easy because, you, you, you know, you got you just buy a few materials, buy some paints, buy some paint, um, you know, uh, the, the paper and some brushes um i went along to this thing and and I, I like introduced myself to him and he i remember still to this day what he did he like brought me up to the front and he said to everyone you know this is 
you know, we need to be helping younger artists out and, um, you know, we need to be supporting them more. And, and he was, you know, because the whole room was just, because um, with, with these events, it's mainly um, people, I think about 50, maybe 60 plus um, that tend to go along to, to these events. So I think I sort of stuck out a bit too much. And so he managed to set something like that. But that was a big inspiration to me to, to, keep, on, to keep on going because I think um, with watercolors, it, it can be an unforgiving medium to, be, to start out with. But I think it comes as a mental thing. It, it's more like you have to accept the, the mistakes um, and I know some people they can like erase mistakes um, you know, lifting off paint it's still possible um, but for the most part like if you're doing a big dark wash and it just put it in the wrong place or it's too dark you kind of got to accept that and that I, I found that it kind of not only that that way of thinking impacted my art but it impacted my personal life as well I became more you know, being able to let go of things that happened to me. Um, and that kind of comes in with my psychology background. I saw like a bit of a, a, a parallel between that. And it was a way of to, that, that kind of helped me to be more conscious of the way I think and about my feelings. And if I'm upset about something that's happened, um, how can I work with it? How can I use mm. that and learn from it? And I think that was... Um, that really sat with me. Like it really resonated with me from a philosophical perspective and that the beauty of watercolors is as well. Like it just has this um, beautiful transparent nature. It's different from other types of mediums. So the, 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 the light shines through the page and then it reflects back through the transparent pigment. So everything kind of looks like it glows. I just thought it looked so magical combined, you know, compared to other types of mediums. Um, I mean, oils and acrylics, they're very beautiful in their own regard, but I think, watercolors had, has its own appeal and I know throughout history it's been something where it hasn't been respected as as much um, it's been used more as a sketch medium um, but it's it really it's really something something special and the unpredictability of it and how it kind of does what it wants to do at times it creates a certain kind of beauty and in, in kind of imperfection that looks beautiful in its own way. And, and you can't do that with any other medium. I, I find um, with other paint mediums anyway, because whatever you put on the paper, it just stays like that. And a bit of art, a bit of oil, you just put onto the paper and it doesn't move unless you shake the paper <laughs> or the, the, the canvas. I mean, um, that, that, that was very, it's kind of exciting. It was a more exciting experience for me. It was something um, kept me on my feet. Yeah. And you're not the first artist who said, with other mediums, they don't move, like acrylic, for instance, it's so rigid. Well, with watercolor, the unpredictability of it and the way it creates this beautiful accidents, they're just magical. And also mention about how you apply that principle in your life about mistakes, because you said that watercolor can be very unforgiving, but at the same time, you should learn to be able to accept that it is unforgiving. The follow-up question that I have for you, Darren, is, Something to do with watercolor mentor. When you started, you you mentioned that you're always about to give up. Mm. You were frustrated. And yeah. it shifted because you realized that though it's an unforgiving medium, it can also provide you with beautiful, you know, surprises. The mm. way that it works is the unpredictability of it. And like what I said, it's magical in that sense. Mm. But you created watercolor mentor. Mm. And I, I was reading through the mission of that, um, of that community. Encourage others to create and to make art more accessible. Mm. And with your psychology background, it will allow you to provide feedback and mentoring. So mm. take me through that process of you creating Watercolor Mentor. How long has it been, by the way? Um, it's, it's roughly been about a, a year. So just over a, a year. Okay. Um, I uh, I think I the first thing I did was I opened a YouTube channel at the end of July. I think maybe like 29th of July, but I didn't upload anything until maybe August. Wanted it to be more rather than more more just me posting my artwork and saying, "Hey, look at this, look at that." I wanted it to be something like a community where um, people could because not not everyone paints to to obviously to improve. Like some people just paint because they they love they like to meditate it's like a meditative kind of thing mm -hmm. um so so i think i wanted to create a learning community but also like a, a community that was accepting of people who you know who paint from all different 
you know, kind of reasons and have, you know, have free resources um, and, and basically someone that could give uh, more personalized feedback. Um, and at the time it was like a lot easier for me to get back to people. <laughs> it, it, and that the name was something like that took, uh, initially I, I named it watercolor coach because I couldn't think of what to name it. <laughs> but, um, you know, just <laughs> find the name, right? Yeah. You, 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 yeah, you, you basically are. And um, I was thinking, you know, uh, coach is more like a sporting thing, you know, people holding whistles and stuff like that. So um, I, I ended up thinking, well, I think the, the like mentor is something that mm -hmm. I in my personally enjoy uh helping people where i can so I, I get a lot of um i get a lot of satisfaction and um yeah it's just very rewarding for me to if i'm ever in a position where i can uh, yeah just provide some some knowledge or some tips or advice um to, to people um you know I'll, I'll go ahead and i'll go ahead and do that because when i started off i think it was hard to 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 find um a community uh, mm -hmm. of of people that you know would get together and you know support each other with uh with specifically with watercolors and I, I was going online trying to find information here and there i'd look at paintings by my favorite watercolor artists and i try to figure out how do they paint it what are they what are they doing and it was just frustrating because i didn't how did how did they create this thing i couldn't um, take it apart and so I, I wanted to create, uh, you know, something that would break things down to people. Um, and, and I think I'm okay. You know, people say I'm, I'm, I'm decent at explaining stuff. So um, I, I thought I could use that part of it and, you know, my psychology background to, you know, it, it, in a way help people um, get through this sort of uh, pandemic as, as well, because I know it was a tough time last year. And for me as well, I started it during a time where, um, we were in lockdown and I had nothing else to do. And I thought, if I don't do something with this time, I'm going to go nuts. So, <laughs> so from a, from a tough situation, I created something that I feel can reach out to the community and um, provides, uh, yeah, just, just a safe place where people can ask for help, post their work, um, make friends and, and, and enjoy this, this hobby of, of watercolor paintings. Yeah, that's right resonates with with your idea of creating a community a safe space where people can share their works and without the pressure of you know being judged whether your art is good or not but it's really more about the community creating a community of people who are who can connect with each other through art and when I was going through watercolor mentor you have a very engaged community with over a hundred thousand people mm. part of that community and it's amazing that you started that from, from a really difficult situation, like what you said, it's a rough situation and circumstance, and it opens up to one idea, it brings you an idea of something that will provide a safe space, will create connection, will foster engagement through art. Let's talk about your style of painting. I know I did mention earlier that you do portraiture landscapes and you do also urban sketching. Which one of those subjects would you say is your favorite? Oh, I'd, I'd say like landscapes slash urban landscapes okay. are, are my favorite. Yeah. Landscapes. Okay. In terms of style, your style is very loose, but it's very distinct as well. It's, it's a style that you would recognize. I know that this is barren. How did you develop that? Or has it always been the type of style that you pursued when you started with watercolor? Mm. Um, I, I think like, you know, when you're, when you're developing a style, when you're first, um, you, you know, starting out, it's really important to, uh, look at other artists mm -hmm. and, um, you know, initially you try to figure out what they're doing and, and, and initially try to copy what they're doing. Um, but then you look at other artists and you try their, what they're doing and you look at their tips and eventually you develop something of a, a combination and, and you pick out the bits and pieces that you like. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, for, for me, my, my style, you know, I know that, um, I I want to I want to I want to have fun when making art, and, but everyone has their own 
their, their, their own way of, of, of doing art. So for, for me, it was just trying to figure out a way of painting and making it, you know, making it my own representation of a scene. You know, I, I like having, I like scenes that are high contrast. So things with lots of light, lots of darkness in there. I also love using complementary colors and sometimes people might think it looks a bit my style looks a bit gaudy there's just so many colors here, here and there um not all my stuff is like that with your background being a sculpturist as well as self-development and then now doing watercolor how do you incorporate all of those things your background into your work of art that concept of self-development and um knowing that it takes it takes time one if you're doing like one painting uh you know it takes a lot of time to layer all the the different colors on and plan it even before you start painting i'm like planning in my head i'm painting in my head like what it might look like <laughs> um so the whole process even starts before then so you kind of got to think where do i want to be or what do i in terms of my painting what do i want it to look like mm -hmm. and then from there you plan out the kind of cumulative process and, and go on. Also, I like the, the part where you said that everyone has their own path. It doesn't mean that, you know, you practice every day for, for eight hours and you get to some point that you're going to be a professional artist. It's, you know, it's your own path. You will carve your own path. But what you're saying is that you have to be consistent and you have to be patient enough to go through the process and then see mm -hmm. where it will lead you. Now, most of our listeners are hobbyists and beginners. And I, I remember you talking about struggling at the beginning and you were all almost on the verge of giving up. So any pieces of advice or golden nuggets that you can share with our listeners or our audience who are either on the fence, whether they would want to pursue watercolor or any type of medium. With watercolors, uh, you know, always try to stick with it. Stick with it and finish the painting. Uh, if you start it, try your best to finish it. And the, the reason why I say that is because watercolors is a cumulative process. You, you don't really see the painting develop into something that looks uh, like whatever you're painting until even halfway or three quarters of the way through. Uh, it's, it's, the painting only starts to take shape once you add shadows and you add a few features and people in there. Mm -hmm. then, then the mind starts to see, see those um those features in there i think a lot of people give up they when they kind of get halfway through the painting it doesn't look like anything but you haven't even completed it and that's the the most important thing i'd say like you know stick through it if you end up with the painting at the at the end then you've you, you've you've won and it doesn't have to be in your mind successful it the the most of the paintings that i do uh what i did when i started out were unsuccessful in my mind they look terrible but i've learned so much from them you learn next time okay that's too dark i'm gonna do it again so you're kind of introspecting on your work you're looking at it then you're trying to look at it objectively and think I, okay this part here is too dark that bit comparing it to the reference and comparing it to what how you you wanted to portray it in your mind and i think that's the hardest thing like trying to find a balance um between actually portraying the subject and portraying what you want it to look like because people get frustrated when what they paint isn't anything like what they look what it looks like in their mind and that's because you just need more practice on the on the techniques so the techniques are so important that's why sketching using sketchbooks is is it's like an easy way to to sort of do it um another thing i would say is like a lot of people feel like you have to have to be inspired mm -hmm. to paint you have to be in the, the the feeling you have to feel like like painting um and often like you know, if you have the feeling and you have the inspiration to paint, that's a great thing. Like, paint just just do it straight. Then, if you've got it, just just um, use it while it's there. But there's a lot of times, um, yeah. There's basically a lot of times during the week that I don't particularly feel like painting as well. Um, I'll be kind of so so, and at times I won't even feel like it at all. Mm -hmm. But the the hardest part is like we have so many distractions in our world these days. Painting back you know, 300 years ago would have probably been the most exciting thing because there's no TV, there's no games, there's no, you know, chocolate yeah. bars and things. Mm -hmm. So the, nowadays we have all these competing com competing uh, things um, th th that, are, that seem more fun. TV, 
you know, I've got the fridge just next to me and I'm always going through looking at the fridge and oh, there's something there I can eat or I could do a painting. So of course, you know, those things are going to, are going to win out um, at times. And I think you, you've got to take the easiest step when you first, if you don't have that inspiration, try something small. You just start with a pencil sketch, the easiest thing possible and maybe a little watercolor sketch just with one color. And you'll find more than often that when you're just starting or you're getting halfway through that little sketch, you suddenly get into it and, and you develop that motivation and that inspiration. So you can't always wait for it to come through to you. And when you learn how to do that as a, as a beginner or it's anything in life really, then you can train your brain to, uh, to start because starting is one of the hardest things to do okay. in any activity um you know talk to students they, they just procrastinate and procrastinate before because mm -hmm. picking up and opening that book is just you know you're already stressing about thinking thinking of it so um just keep at it and eventually over time the little bits of time that you put in they all add up it's, you know i think the people use the, the term like brush mileage mm -hmm. so it's kind of like driving a car right i like that <laughs> i like that Thank you so much, Darren, for those tips. And those are indeed golden nuggets for our audience. I'm sure the people who heard those two tips that you mentioned will definitely put it into practice. And hopefully they will inspire you as well to make more art. But all the best with Watercolor Mentor as well. I know that you're helping a lot of people get into art and you know, inspiring and encouraging them to keep on creating. So Darren, thank you so much for being part of Make More Art, the podcast. And again, it's it's been a pleasure having you with on with with Esther as well as one of our teachers. Your recording is still up on our website. If you guys want to check that out, uh, please do so. Uh, Darren has amazing technique, and if you want to learn more about her skills of uh, how he paints his landscapes and also does portraiture, then do check out the recording. Thank you so much, Darren, for being on the show. Thank you, Jesse. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Take care. See you. Thanks. Bye. Such a brilliant mind with a generous heart, there it is. This interview made me shift my perspective and see the silver lining in a current storm. It got me thinking how an idea can convert into something that can add value to people around us, just like the watercolor mentor. How about you? Do you have stories of how art has granted you the experience to see past me in your circumstances? Do let us know by leaving a comment through the blog post associated with this podcast at extralab.com slash Darren. Want to know what goes behind the scenes here at Etcher? We heard ya! We are lifting the curtain and giving you VIP access to do just that. Get to know who does what here at Etcher Lab. So joining me for the Etcher Team Spotlight is Christine Jose. She is our marketing officer and I will let her share more information about herself but welcome to make more art the podcast christine i know we've been working closely because you do several things for the podcast so can you tell us a little bit more about yourself so i mainly work with etcher lab i i handle most of the social media platforms specifically facebook instagram twitter and tiktok but on top of that, I also handle the blogs and our email newsletter. So that includes everything from the copywriting, planning out what gets posted throughout the week. And I also film all of the TikTok content and think of all of the memes or all of the, the funny posts you see online from us. You seem to be a very busy girl, Christine, doing a lot of things for Etcher Lab and TikTok. Wow, you look so young. So I'm assuming, yeah, you're perfect for the, for the role um, to do a lot of memes. I think you mentioned in your bio that you do a lot of cat memes. Is that right? So I yeah. would assume you're a cat person. <laughs> We're just talking about dogs offline. <laughs> well, I like both cats and dogs. I actually volunteer at... Um, a nonprofit. It it was at my old school, so we feed a lot of stray cats. Oh, oh, that's so nice. But yeah. okay, so uh, marketing officer. So you be you you're yeah, like what I said, a very busy girl. So marketing, and then you said copywriting, and then video, so content as well. Which of those yes. things 
would you say is your favorite? I would say content creation is my favorite okay. because I get to try all of the products. It's very, oh. very fun. <laughs> I would say this very fun. I would, let's, can we trade? Can we trade John do the interview and I'll test the product? But our products are really good and I have several of them as well, but you get to test all of them. So yeah. awesome. Okay. So I'm interested to know as well, because I, I know we work closely for the podcast since you do for the blog and then uh, yeah, TikTok and YouTube as well. So on a typical day, how, how does it look like for you for a marketing officer since you are spread across our different platforms? Um, I guess a typical day would start with me replying to emails because I also handle some of the collaborations with influencers. Um, and then I will start planning for all of the content. I kind of do that all in one go. It takes a few hours, sometimes the whole day to do that. Wow. And um, some days I'm just going to film the whole day or some days it's, it's just all planning. It really does depend. I like it. You, you, I think when you touch on batch content or batching is, is something because you do like one day filming and then I wish I could I could apply that. Um, I know social media <laughs> um, management is quite, you know, it's it's really a very, what would I call this? It's very tasky, well, a lot of things and you really need to plan ahead. And you doing that while being across all our other platforms. Yeah. You are very yeah. busy. <laughs> You're very busy. <laughs> yeah. So when, when did you start working for Etcher? I started this year. Just in in April. Oh wow! So I started June. So you're just a month ahead of me. But yeah. you know, in, in terms of engagement, because you you do social media right for Astro Lab and you do TikTok. Are you in charge of replying to comments as well? I used to, oh. but now it since there's been a shift in the tasks, yeah. I I no longer have to do that. Okay. If, transfer that to Danny, our community manager. Oh yeah, Danny. Probably have her on as well to talk about that. So being uh being across all our platforms, social media and you said content, um, do you do any because I know you mentioned earlier that replying to comments um is no longer part of your job. But I think with content creation, that is your way of connecting with our audience. Because the content that you create and correct me if I'm wrong on this, will have to be something that would connect and people can resonate with. Is, is that the thought process behind what you do as well, Christine? Yeah, I think when it comes to marketing in general, when you create content, you really have to think of who's going to see it, who our target audience is. So my main goal with all of our, all of our posts is one, to educate, and two, to engage, and to promote. I love it. Educate, engage, and promote, of course. But the education part, I think seeing the content that, that from Etcher Lab, it's really educational. And the blog posts that, that we have on, a lot of people are reading and getting tips and tricks about you know, the type of brushes, paints, mixes, and all that. So. Thank you for all of your content, um, Christine. So with the time that you spend from April to now, I know it's just, just a bit of time from, from that point uh, to now and similar with me as well. But I feel like I've worked with Asher for like a long time, especially with the kind of engagement that I do with the podcast and hosting artists. What would you say would be the major highlight from that point to now in your role as a marketing officer? Um, I think the major highlight is being able to work in a company um, whose values match my own. I find that Etcher is the type of company that really does value education. So I, I think, as you know, within the company, we have monthly trainings. Yes. And it doesn't even have to necessarily be in relation to what we're doing. They're just very focused on on educating all of us so that we can experience 
and learn a lot from from each other. That's a really good point. And on, on that note as well, it will allow us, it will equip us as well on how we can better assist our customer. Christine, yeah. it's been fun chatting with you. And thank you again for agreeing to do a quick interview with me. I learned so much about what you do. I mean, looking at marketing officer is such a broad title, but you <laughs> talk about what you do specifically broadens my mind about what exactly marketing officer does. So thank you for being part of Make More Art Podcast. Thank you, Alisa. Bye. Thank you. We would love to hear your thoughts. So please drop us a five-star review on the Apple Podcast where you can find us on YouTube at Ezra Studio. And oh, hitting the subscribe button is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll catch you again next time. Until then, let's make more art.